And now our host, Stephen Lee Morris. Welcome to Animal Farming. Thanks to the cast and crew of City Garage for hosting this weekly discussion of theater, politics, and pets. Now, um, why pets, you may ask? Well, George Orwell aside, animals actually understand that the, they understand the world they're living in, uh, that, that they don't live in alternative realities or social media silos. Unlike us, they say what they mean and they mean what they say. And for these reasons, among others, they earn our regard and our affection. And quite frankly, they help keep us sane if, um, if sane we are. So if you have a particularly um, intriguing or amusing video of your pet, please consider sharing it with us. Um, or if there's a topic you'd like to hear discussed on the show, please send either of those to citygarage.org forward slash animal farm. I'll say that again, citygarage is one word, dot org forward slash animal farm is also one word. John Lawrence Rivera founded Playwrights Arena to produce and direct original works exclusively by Los Angeles playwrights. And he stuck to this mission for close to 40 years. He has survived race riots, or I should say his theater has survived race riots, earthquakes, greedy landlords, and the exigencies of intimate theater. Just to note a full disclosure, over the past 20 years, John has produced five of my plays, the most recent being a dark comedy about journalism. It was called Red Ink, and it was produced in January and February of this year, just before COVID-19 slammed into Southern California. John is currently presenting what may be the first live theater presentation since the onslaught of COVID. It's presented in partnership with LGBT LA Center. It's called March. It opened October 17th and plays through November 15th. John Lawrence Rivera, welcome to Animal Farm. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here. So uh, as we all know, it's been a terrific, 2020 has been a terrific year for politics, for the arts, every, the ebullience and the enthusiasm is, is you, you can feel it dripping off the walls of all the theaters of how pleased people have been with how, what a successful season it's been. No, that aside, um, after the COVID, if, if we could imagine such a thing, I just want to ask you what, how do you envisage the impact of this? Is this an opportunity for us to rethink the models of theater, the affordable ability of theater? Um, even before COVID hit, much of American theater was um, an antiquated, using an antiquated business model that wasn't working, frankly. There are exceptions to that for the most part. The theater in this country has been suffering. Is this an opportunity to take a look at the very template, very structures by which we do theater and how to open its doors to, to more people? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the conversation we've been having with uh, some of the artistic directors in, in town is that uh, this is an opportunity, a great opportunity for us to really rethink what the next move is going to be. And I think yeah. there's a lot of conversation about uh, expanding the diversity of programming, uh, the diversity in leadership, uh, in the way that we present work um, and the kinds of, uh, of material that are going to be presented in the future and in places where we might, you know, we might be doing that. I think the, the, the old structure of the regional theater has to be really rethink because that was something that was created by a lot of um, white leaders, white artistic directors uh, who created a, a, a system that was geared mostly for people who have um, a lot of money, which mm -hmm. equates to white audiences. So how do we really change the, the dynamics of theater so that it is really for, for the people and for everybody? And uh, what are we going to do in, in promoting that? Well, so, at Playwrights Arena, ticket prices are not really an issue. They're fair, as these things go, they're fairly modest. That's right. As, as I mean, they I are in... Yeah, I mean, I think any any of the intimate theaters are are as far as ticket prices. I think we're already 
at the bottom of how we're, you know, of how yeah. we're, we're, we're charging people. But, you know, when you have to go to the Amundsen or to the taper and you have to pay $70 or $80 tickets, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and trying to really figure out how to get uh, people, you know, um, people who have no resources, but mostly people who, who have been ignored in, in the presentation um, of these theaters, you know, and uh, having, uh, having a lot of, of seasons where there's probably, in a season of, like, unlike us, we, have one, we only have three shows per hour season, but some regional theaters have seven shows a, a year, and they have seven shows of white, of, you know, straight white men plays, and not women, not even people of color. So I think that has to change. And I think people are actually thinking about, you know, those changes. And I, I'm, I'm beginning to see a shift in the um, leadership of these uh, bigger, bigger theaters and even smaller theaters uh, by having associate or artistic directors who are people of color or, or other senior staff that are people of color who can really help assist in, in defining their, their new you know, their new ways of programming. Right. I think what you're saying is very important in terms of access to an interest in communities that aren't otherwise interested. And that's yes. a way of keeping, that makes sense. But if theaters are going to be 70 to $90 a ticket and they're run by all people of color, it's not going to make a jot of difference. I'm sorry, it's, I'll get no, off my soapbox. But. That, no, that is, that is for sure. And I think that is the big issue of trying to figure out how do we make it accessible? Because if you are doing if you're doing a, uh, you know, if let's just say if you're doing Gem of the Ocean and you wanted African Americans to come and see it and their yeah. resources are very little and how do you expect them to pay a hundred dollar ticket to see Felicia Rashad do the play? You know, you need to figure out how do we get them there with $20 tickets yes. and not just 10, 10 tickets set aside in a 750 seat theater for those people who can get the hot takes for, you know, and there's like 20 seats available for that. Like, how do you get 300 seats at $25 so that yeah. people can come and see it, you know, and it's somebody, big, pay, somebody's got to pay for it. Somebody sure. has to pay for it. And somebody, yeah. you know, trying to find sponsors and, and uh, you know, and corporations who's going to say, we support this project and we're going to pay for, you know, if it's a $75 ticket, we will pay for $50 per ticket. You just, you know, you just sell yeah. twenty dollar tickets to, to everybody else, you know. So it is a big it is a big dynamic shift that's going to be happening. And I I feel that and I keep saying this to my to my colleagues, is that it's not the first year that when we come back where we can where we can make uh, where we can track the change because so I you know, so it's really about uh, trying to uh, see the longevity of it. Because yes. I feel like after this, after the, the after COVID, there's going to be a surge of all this innovation that is going to be very exciting. And what I don't want is two, three years down the line, it comes down, and all of a sudden, all of that is back to the norm that we've been doing yeah. Yeah. before COVID. You know, yeah. so that's where the true challenge is going to be: is how do we sustain that? And how so you're we, you're on this group of artistic directors that's discussing this weekly. Yes, I, I would be very surprised if there wasn't enthusiasm for that this, these ideas, or is there? Oh, there no, there is a lot of, in, uh, of uh, enthusiasm about it, around it. Um, we meet every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, and yeah. uh, there's about 60 artistic directors that are part of it. In most weeks, we'll probably have about 35 to 40 that's, that's in the meeting all the time, and uh, people come and go, and uh, it's really it's really exciting because we're hearing there's a lot of things that we are discussing. We're discussing AB5. We are discussing, you know, uh, actors equities, you know, uh, rules and, and, uh, and problems that we've been having with them. And uh, we're discussing about how, um, how we do, how do we uh, change the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, diversity, inclusion in, in programming. So yes. it's just a lot of that conversation that's been going around and, uh, and, I, and we're very engaged and people are very uh, passionate about those changes. And I think uh, a lot of that is being thoroughly thought out as, as, we, as we are you know, in this pandemic. 
Thank you. Just a point of clarification, AB5 is Assembly Bill 5. It is the, it was designed for the, for, for really Uber, Uber and Lyft drivers as a labor protection amendment to ensure that all those drivers are full-fledged employees making the companies pay them, um, pay them, pay the employee taxes and, and, and benefits and everything else. And in its perhaps misdirection it got slammed onto the arts it got slammed onto the theaters so now the role of independent contractors which has kept community theaters and intimate theaters going all those people are now required to register as employees which raises budgets what 30 percent approximately yes i mean i i would say that um in the last production that we did we have seven actors in it and i think our cost would have Actually, for a small theater, it affects us greatly because we have uh, a small stipend for the actors in, in, in a 50-seat theater, for instance. And uh, if we start doing minimum wage, starting at rehearsal, which is what it would it require to, ha to mm -hmm. use right. AB5, where our small budget for the actors is going to actually triple because we are literally having to pay everyone from day one of rehearsal. And which then makes us think if we are forced to, to use AB5, do we then rehearse for two weeks and open the show? And, and what, does that do, do that? what does that do to the quality and of the And what does it do to the quality yeah. of the production? And yeah. also, it might work if we are doing that of a salesman because you, know, you can learn all the lines and then you go in and you stage it. But when you're doing a new work like we yeah. do, it's like... Yeah. It, there's a lot of discovery, and as you know, as a playwright, I mean, you get a lot of discovery just dealing with, you know, when the actors are in, in, in the room and talking about the play. And, and imagine as, that, as those discussions are happening, the producer is sitting there going, oh my God, there's the money ticking away because we're still right. discussing. And you can't say, no, you have an hour to discuss and then we start staging. I mean, it's, it's not a corporation. We're not, we don't work in that way. It's all, you know, it's all very loose. And this is emblematic of a lot of arguments, not just AB5, right. but with a, with a union and everything else. When, exactly. you know, coming to the question of what is theater and what is the creative process. Speaking of which, I do, we have just a couple of minutes left. I yeah. just wanted to talk to your own production. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first production I've heard of that is actually a return of live performance in the middle of a pandemic. Although in California, the rates, of the, the, the positivity rate is probably as low as it's been in months. That doesn't mean it won't spike, but so far it hasn't. So this production is called March and it is produced in partnership with LGBT Los Angeles. And it is conceived by you um, through play with in a partnership with Playwrights Arena and LGBT Los Angeles. Um, how's that going? It is, it is now open. Yeah, we just opened last night. And, uh, I, you know, I had this very crazy idea about three months ago that I wanted to, I just couldn't, I just didn't think that I could survive the rest of the pandemic just doing Zoom theater. And so I was, I was, I was determined to do something that was live and, and a semblance of, of the, the theater that we used to do. So you got something against uh, Zoom. I, I really resent that. <laughs> Actually, Zoom for me works really well for development work. And, I, uh -huh. and that's why for Playwrights Arena, we use them to, to develop material and hear, hear new work and give notes and hear it again. So in that way, it, I, I feel like it's very effective. Uh, and I think it's effective in, in other ways of presentations. But... But for me, I just felt like I wanted to be in the room, in the room with, with actors and, uh, and uh, present a play where the audience can actually see it live and not virtually. So, so in a nutshell, was, how is this working? How are, are you adhering to the CDC guidelines, which so I understand we, you are? Yes, so the uh, actors are masked. They have a face mask and a shield <laughs> the entire rehearsal process. So and they have to be... <laughs> When they come in, they have to be a uh, temperature check. Every the stage manager goes as soon as you come through the door, temperature check, and and you know, and then six. This is very Fahrenheit four fifty one. It inches. is, and we've even asked our audiences who have seen the show. I, we said, how does it? You know, how do you how do you feel about the actors with the mask and the shield during the performance? And they were like, 
And they said, you know, after a while, we just forget that they have the shield and the face because, you know, and I, I just like we do when we go to the grocery store, we just like yeah. forget that everybody has, you know, that that's a new thing for us. That, but also a lot of uh, ancient theater that they all bore. Or masks, masks, right? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. So that has been, so it's worked out that way for us. I mean, because we've even in the staging of it. You now know, the audience is where? The audience is in their cars? Do they in, get out of their cars? They don't get out of their cars. They stay in their car and everything, they hear the entire play through their radio, through their FM radio. <laughs> <laughs> so they go into a station and somebody actually, uh, our techni sound technician goes to every car to just make sure that they can hear it. And then, you know, and then we start to play. And so it's a drive-in theater. It's, it's a it variation. Is drive -in, it is drive-in yeah. theater. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So very cool. It's been exciting. March continues through November the 15th. And um, John Lawrence Rivera, thank you so much for uh, joining us in our inaugural our inaugural episode next week, we will have Rob Weinert Kent, the um, editor of American Theater Magazine, joining us. And until then, have a good week. Stay tuned for our first pet videos. Mm -hmm.